with um, whose turn is it? Yes, it is. On page not 59. It is natural to be influenced in sentiments and conduct by one's neighbors and associates and observe the customs of one's fellow citizens. Here it is. Maimonides, remember, talked about the dispositions you're born with, what we would call nature or genetics, right? Now he's going to talk about your environment, your social environment, nurture, so to speak. He considers both of these to be very important in the spiritual advancement of, of people and, of course, the society. In other words, if you're born in a city of thieves, it's going to be very difficult for you not to become a thief. You can still do it because you have free will, which he gets to in his laws of repentance, but it's going to be really tough for you not to become a thief. Read on. Hence, a person ought constantly to associate with the righteous and frequent the company of the laws, so as to learn from their practices and shun the wicked who are benighted so as not to be corrupted by their example. So Solomon said, He that walks with the wise shall be wise, but the companion of the fools shall smart for it. And it is also said, Happy is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked. And of course, notice how often he quotes Proverbs, which of course is the wisdom literature, which tradition said was composed by Solomon. There's a lot of things that he believes in that he finds already a precursor to in the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is, is very clear. You know, you don't want to become a fool, don't hang around with fools. See, in, in Proverbs, there's this, the, two, the two sort of ways are the way of the fool and the way of the wise. Or right? even if you're not a fool, you're known by the company you keep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it, right. All right, so read on, so too. So too, if one lives in a country where the customs are pernicious and the inhabitants do not go in the right way, he should leave for a place where the people are righteous and follow the ways of the good. Notice that. If you find yourself in a corrupt society, get the heck out of there. It's not good for you to live there. And of course, he himself, you know, had to go into X to, to move in order to be able to fully practice his, his tradition and because of the fanatical... Uh, Berbers in North Africa, and there were many w Jewish refugees who had fled from those places. So this notion that if you're in a terrible place, you pick up and leave is one that he both personally experienced as well as other people around him. And, and uh, it's also in, there's, in rabbinic traditions, there's also sort of sayings about it. You know, if you, you're in a place where things are bad, go somewhere else. Read on. If all the countries of which he has personal knowledge or concerning which he hears reports follow a course that is not right, as is the case in our times, or if military campaigns or sickness debar him from leaving for a country with good customs, he should live by himself in seclusion. As it is said, let him sit alone and keep silent. So notice even he will go to the point where, yeah, you know, you could become a hermit if necessary. Um, and notice he says... You know, the country is pernicious, right? Um, as in the case of our times, or military. I mean, he's living in the middle of the Crusades, right? So yes. he's saying there's a lot of terrible things going on, and if you know, if you have to go and live by yourself, get away from it somehow. Read on. And, and if the inhabitants are wicked reprobates who will not let him stay in the country unless he mixes with them and adopts their evil practices, let him withdraw to caves, thickets, or deserts, and not habituate himself to the ways of sinners. As it is said, oh, that I were in the wilderness in a lodging place of wayfaring men. So while normally he, he is against people who go off into the desert and become hermits, which Jews were doing, obviously, remember, because he's against that kind of extreme asceticism, He's saying there's a time and place even for that if necessary. Because you're living in a terrible place and you really need to get away and there's nowhere else to go or you can't get there because of wars and things. Go live by yourself, even if it's in a cave in the desert. It's fascinating. Yes, Robert? I don't know what he's going to say later on, but does he assume that you shouldn't try to improve this society? Well, if you are a Talmud Chacham, yes, you are supposed to influence people, absolutely. Um, again, don't forget, he's living in a time when Jews have no sovereignty, right? They only have a limited amount of ability to influence society. The best he can do is influence his fellow Jews, right? And, and by the way, 
that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, he wants the Messianic age to come. So Jews can go back to their land and have self-government and have self-determination, which, of course, is what Zionism said at the beginning. So Maimonides felt that unless the Jews had ruled themselves under their own system of laws and government, you know, under their own rulers, that there is a certain shame to that, as well as an inability to completely fulfill the Torah, that the Jews will not be able to create the society they, the Torah expects us to create until the time of the Messiah when we can rule ourselves. Self-determination. Do you think, do you, is he, in going through this, he gives constant references to Torah or to the um, various the prophets. Yeah, uh-huh. Is, is he taking a, do you think he's taking a subject and explaining to us that which he <coughs> understands from them, or is he explaining what he believes and backing it up with quotes from them? Both. In other words, he believes that what he is doing is already in the tradition. And he's, he's merely... Um, Explicating it. Yes, yes he's kind absolutely. of uh, purifying it. Uh, well, yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's got a refinery, and he's taking all this stuff, and he's giving yeah. it the, the I don't essence. Think, I don't think he's just cynically trying to find verses to back up what he says. But no doubt about the fact that he's also creative, right? In other words... Like all great thinkers, he is rereading, reinterpreting um, the tradition in the way he understands it. And in some case, you know, a lot of cases he's picking up, you know, exactly what the text is saying, but he's putting it in the context of his whole uh, approach, which is that of a man in the Middle Ages who is deeply imbued in the Jewish tradition and deeply imbued in philosophy. Right? I mean, yes. he, you yes. know, there was, a, there was a deep, there was a belief amongst Jews that philosophy began with Moses, and it was the Jews had lost philosophy, and the Greeks had picked it up, and therefore, by studying philosophy, you weren't studying foreign knowledge, but in fact, you were recapturing ancient Jewish knowledge that, you know, Jews had forgotten. So for him, this is the tradition. Okay. Um, okay, let's just look at the, the whatever... Number two, he talks about how you're supposed to attach yourself to the sages and your disciples because therefore, um, you know, that will make you a better person. So you should try and marry a, a scholar's daughter if possible or give your daughter in marriage to a scholar. Of course, this became a, a very common idea in the Jewish tradition. It's one of the reasons why all the scholarly families in Europe, all the great rabbinic families were all, you know, interrelated with one another. Um, you know, it's like Rashi marrying his daughters to his students and... Most of the great rabbis of Europe, of Ashkenaz, were all descendants of Rashi, you know. So um, he then talks about, number three, about love your neighbor as yourself. This is about Ahavat Yisrael, actually, according to him, the love of your fellow Jew. In number four, he talks about loving the proselyte, the ger. And in fact, there's a famous response, a letter he wrote to a proselyte named Ovadja, um, who wanted to know whether he could say when he was praying the Amida, oh, God and God of our ancestors, after all, he wasn't my ancestor. And Maimonides, against some uh, scholars, said, no, you are part of the descendants of Abraham by becoming a Jew. So you, you must say, Eloheinu, Velohei Avotenu, Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzhak, Velohei Yaakov. Right? So he was very much... Um, you know, understanding that what's most important about the Jewish tradition is not our genetic heritage, but our spiritual heritage. All right? Um, he talks about the prohibition of hatred of the fellow Jews, um, and he talks about, uh, starting in number seven, he talks about rebuke, that it is a positive mitzvah if you see someone committing a sin to rebuke them. But, of course... He, um, he, tr he, he sets boundaries to it. Look at number eight. He who rebukes another must not at first speak to the offender harshly so as to put him to shame. There's a way to go about it, a menschlich way, we would say, to gently rebuke somebody if you see them going um, in the wrong way. Okay? 
Um, look at number nine on the next page. If one who has been wronged by another does not wish to rebuke or speak to the offender because the latter is very a very common person or mentally defective, and if he sincerely has forgiven him and neither bears him or rebukes him, he acts according to the standard of the saints, meaning beyond the letter of the law. Turn the other cheek. Yeah. In other words, you know, you don't, you know, you know, if you forgive the person, you don't have to rebuke them. Um, but that's not the, st the normal standard, right? Um, notice number 10. A somebody want to pick read this up, uh, Robert? A man ought to especially? <clears throat> a man ought to be especially heedful of his behavior towards widows and orphans, for their souls are exceedingly depressed and their spirits are low. Even if they are wealthy, even if they are the widow and orphan of a king, we are specifically enjoined concerning them, as it is said, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. How are we to conduct ourselves towards them? One must not speak to them otherwise than tenderly. One must show them unvarying courtesy, not hurt them physically with hard toil, or wound their feelings with harsh speech. One must take greater care of their property than of one's own. Whoever irritates them, provokes them to anger, pains them, tyrannizes over them, or causes them loss of money, is guilty of a transgression, and still more so if one beats them or curses them. Stop there. Uh, in the Torah itself, the categories of widows, orphans, and resident aliens, namely non-citizens, green card aliens, um, are what you might call classical categories in Near Eastern law of those who are powerless and marginal and therefore need special protection, right? Um, and so you find numerous references in the Torah to protecting the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. Now Maimonides has already talked about, now the rabbinic tradition understood the stranger to be a proselyte, to be a convert. That's how they interpreted it. Because the category didn't apply anymore in Jewish society in Talmudic times because the category in the Torah is talking about non-Israelites who live permanently in the land of Israel, therefore, because they're not part of the tribal or clan system, cannot own any land. Therefore, they are not enfranchised, right? Nonetheless, they may be a merchant or somebody who has set up shop in an Israelite town or whatever, and he's there permanently. And there are lots of specific areas in the Torah where it specifically says you are not to oppress them, you're supposed to protect them. In fact, one of the few, one of, after you know the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, there's a commandment to love the stranger, love this person, right? Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So Maimonides is picking up on these classical, um, you know, legal categories, which are the powerless and the marginal in society, which God shows, a, according in Exodus, especially a particular concern for. They are under the particular eye, so to speak, of God, and here. He's turning it into a whole, you know, ethic of human relationships because there are plenty of widows and orphans in his society given, you know, the vicissitudes of life, right? Yes, Suzanne. Um, so orphan really means fatherless. And motherless. Okay? I mean, I People without he parents. Says here, widow or fatherless child. Yeah, well, I think that I think that that's a that's just a translation of orphan, but the point is it could be either. It could be either. Yeah, but I think mostly it's 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 fatherless. it's someone who is who doesn't have parents at all. Harvey, were you going to ask something? No. Okay. Yes, Robert. There, there appears to be a little bit of a contradiction between number 4 and this one. You have just said that he considers the stranger to be a proselyte. Yes, he does. And then in number four, you said that you are obliged to say... That's or, a pros or, Avadja was a proselyte that he's speaking to. But the, what I don't understand is, does a proselyte ever become a Jew? A proselyte is a Jew. It's just that a proselyte is a special category under Jewish law because they weren't born Jewish, and therefore there are certain things that are different with them. Like, and a very practical thing, if a proselyte's parent dies, does he sit shiva, she, he or she sit shiva, do they say Kaddish? And these are issues that have actually come up, in, obviously, in the modern world that, you know, even I had to deal with that kind of thing. I'm at, there's a guy I knew who went to rabbinical school who was a convert, and his 
father died while he was in rabbinical school, and he had to sort of try and deal with this, that he wasn't mm. supposed to sit Shiva. Because? Because when he becomes a, a proselyte, you see, there's two things that happen. When you become a, a convert, it's as if your previous parentage no longer counts. You are now the child of Abraham and Sarah. On the other hand, there's the very human aspect of it. Your parents are your, your real parents are your parents. So what do you do? And how do you balance that? And so what uh, one of our Talmud teachers told this guy was, you can't sit Shiva, but you can say Kaddish. Okay? And um, so you have to sort of balance the very... It's, it's the same thing with an adoption. Legally, in Judaism, there actually is no such thing as adoption. If a Jewish child is adopted by a Jewish couple, um, their, his biological parents, he or she, is still their parents. And, you know, even if they die, if they die and they never, he never saw them since, you know, he was an infant, he's still obligated to sit Shiva. Um, but the fact is, is that there's a recognition that there's an attachment to the uh, uh, adopted parents. If the child was not Jewish originally, it's converted to Judaism and therefore has no connection to its... So if a Jewish man gets divorced and marries another Jewish woman... Yes. ...and the first former wife dies... He doesn't have to sit Shiva for her. He can. I've never heard of such a case. Uh, honestly, I haven't. Uh, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that one. It makes no sense to me that even though your parents may not have been Jewish, that you shouldn't sit shit. Well, what, the, what, what this teacher of ours was trying to do was to balance what was the tradition said versus the psychological need of this man. I, I find it interesting, to digress a little bit, that he considers Kaddish to be less of an imposition, imposition than sitting Shiva. It's not imposition. It's the, the purpose of it. And Shiva is, has a much stronger sort of foundation in Halakha than St. Kaddish. Also, sh Shiva is for the living and the Kaddish is for the... No, Shiva, Shiva is for two reasons. Jewish, Jewish mourning customs are, have two basic rationales, to honor the dead and to comfort the mourners. And Shiva is for both, right? And most of them cover both circumstances. Um, there's a few, you know, like... Taking care of the body of the person who dies, that's, that's honoring the dead, right? And, and that's when a person dies, that's what you're supposed to. Initially, everything is directed towards the honoring of the dead by the making sure of the proper pr uh, preparation of the body and the speedy burial and so on and so forth. But the minute that person is under the ground, so to speak, and the mourners say Kaddish for the first time um, at the gravesite, the, it is now shifted to. You know, yes, uh, still honoring the dead, but now it's primarily comforting the mourners. Is this a rabbinic interpretation? No, this is the way the Jewish tradition is. It's just the way it is. No, I mean, in terms of uh, proselyte, unable to make. Yes, unable of course. To... No, it's a rabbinic uh, law, basically, a rabbinic legislation. There's nothing in the Torah about that, because the Torah doesn't envision the concept of converts, because mm -hmm. they didn't exist at that time. Okay. Um, what about who? Yeah, but the rabbis read back into that that she was a convert, but in the days of Ruth, in the days of the judges, there was no such thing as a convert. A woman married into a clan or a tribe and became part of that clan or tribe. Uh, that's so she's what, unusual because she followed the mother-in-law or because she was already considered... No, well, she, yeah, she, she, uh, legally she could have gone just gone back to her own family and she was always a Moabite. The point is... In, in in biblical in Israelite times, the your identity came down through your father. So if a man marries a former uh, a woman outside of the Israelites, his children are Israelites. You know, it's the rabbinic tradition that made Ruth a convert in the formal, formal sense of the term. Conversion, as we understand it, really evolved in the Second Temple period. It didn't exist in the First Temple period. Um, okay, uh, chapter seven is about. Um, saying uh, slander and lies about people. Um, and, um, and that's really a bad thing. And when you get to the laws of repentance, he actually you know, says it's very difficult to do any form of repentance if you've uh, slandered somebody. How are you going to fix it? You know. Um, and um, and um, number eight, you're not supposed to bear grudges. So this is all about that aspect of it. And uh, having finished that, I want to move on to the, the section on the study of Torah. 
So if you take a look at the... Is, it, is, it, is he writing about this because it's in Leviticus, all this... Well, he don't be, he, well, yeah, he's because he's trying to explicate every one of the 613 okay. commandments, so that's why he deals with it, right? Okay, so in the material I've given you, he sees the study of Torah, there are two mitzvot. Two, two mitzvot, both positive. One is to study Torah itself, all right? Um, and, um, and the other is to honor those who study it and know it meaning proper respect due to the sage, right? Um, so let's, let's take a look at some of these things because there's one uh, aspect of it that is quite interesting um, that I want to... Um, <laughs> uh, want, to, want to do this. So, chapter one, uh, number eight. Let's, uh, whose turn is it? Uh, Reese, uh, no, Brian, I think it's your turn. Is this on the. Oh. On page 64. <laughs> chapter one, Halakha eight. Every Israelite. Okay. Every yeah, Israelite is, um, is under an obligation to study Torah, whether he is poor or rich, in sound health or ailing, in the vigor of youth or very old and feeble. Even a man so poor that he is maintained by charity or goes begging from door to door, as also a man with a wife and children to support, is under the obligation to set aside a definite period during the day and at night for the study of the Torah, as it is said, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Okay, so the study of Torah, which of course is considered the highest spiritual activity in rabbinic Judaism from the Talmudic times, um, he, of course, is part of that tradition, so for him it is essential that all adult male Jews study Torah, whether it be a little bit or a lot, depending upon what you're capable of and what you can do. But he says nobody is exempt from it. And by the way, that's the whole reason why um, you know, that, that attitude goes back into the Torah itself in the book of Deuteronomy. There is that that tradition, and it's the why the, the tradition of the public Torah reading evolved, so that even people who are illiterate, and of course at a time when there were few books, most people learned by memorization, you learned Torah by hearing it publicly. Later on, you know, you, if you had a book or you sit with a teacher, that's what you do. Okay, notice, and go on to number nine, Brian. Among the great sages of Israel, some were hewers of wood, some drawers of water, while others were blind. Notice he takes the three categories of people who are least likely to study Torah. The basic laborers, which are hewers of wood and drawers of water, and a person who's blind. And yet there were great sages in the Talmud who were precisely of these categories. Go on. Nevertheless, they devoted themselves by day and by night to the study of the Torah. They are included among the transmitters of the tradition in the direct line from Moses. Go on. Until what period in life ought one to study Torah? Until the day of one's death, it is as, as it is said, unless they, the precepts, depart from your heart all the days of your life. Whenever one ceases to study, one forgets. Uh, very good point, right? <laughs> Constant reinforcement. All right, Risa, you want to pick up number 11? This is, a very, this is very interesting here. The time allotted to study should be divided into three parts. A third should be devoted to the written law, a third to the oral law, and the last third should be spent in reflection, deducing conclusions from premises, developing implications of statements, comparing dicta, studying the hermeneutical principles by which the Torah is interpreted, till one knows the essence of these principles and how to deduce what is permitted and what is forbidden from what one has learned traditionally. This is termed Talmud. Here he's completely rejigging the traditional curriculum. The traditional curriculum was one-third Bible, one-third Mishnah, one-third Gemara. What he, in effect, is saying, one-third 
Bible, one third Talmudic literature. The other third is devoted to thinking about it. logic, rational thinking. In other words, he's this is the beginning of philosophy, right? Okay? So here he is changing the traditional curriculum to include the study of philosophy, in effect. This is, this is a radical under, uh, thing he's done here. This is a very radical statement for his time. And, of course, he was attacked for this, <laughs> naturally. Um, yes, reason. Excuse me, this goes a little bit back to where we have just been. Yeah. But it's nagging at me. If a person is a, of advanced years, yes, and for that reason his parents have died, is that person considered an orphan? Yes, technically. It doesn't have to be a child who lost... No. Okay, thank you. No, no. Um, what were the three traditional uh, bases of study? Torah? Bible, Mishnah, Gemara. Now, in Ashkenaz, what they tended to do was, they did this according to the curriculum was done. Again, there's some uh, precedent for this in, uh, in rabbinic literature, that when, you, when a child, child first is taught to read Hebrew at age three, by age five, they're studying Talmud, uh, 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 they're studying Bible. Then when they get to a certain age, they study Mishnah, and then they study, from that point on, Gemara. And, Essentially, they don't really go back to studying Bible anymore. Mm -hmm. They spend all of their time focusing on the Talmud. Okay? So it's a very different kind of approach. The notion being that, you know, once you've gone through the Bible, it's kind of, that's kind of the lowest level of study, and then you move on to more sophisticated stuff. Whereas Maimonides obviously thinks that this studying Bible is incredibly important throughout your entire life. And, it, and it's true of the Sephardic curriculum, by the way. Okay, so take a look uh, at the next one, because here you may have different time, you know, amount of time to study depending upon your job. Ellie, do you want to read that, number 12, for example? For example, if one is an artisan who works at his trade three hours a day and devotes nine hours to the study of Torah, he should spend three of these nine hours in the study of the written law three in the study of the oral law, and the remaining three in reflecting on how to deduce one rule from another. That, that's unbelievable, that an artisan <laughs> can somehow work three, day, three hours a day and make a living. Go on. Well, he doesn't say he's making a living. <laughs> <laughs> he obviously has to. Anyway, go on. The words of the prophets are comprised in the written law, while their exposition falls within the category of the oral law. The subject style Pardes. Pardes, esoteric studies, are included in Talmud. This plan applies to the proficient and no longer needs to learn no. the written law. Or but after the, one has become proficient. Oh, but after one has become proficient and no longer needs to learn the written law or continually be occupied with the oral law, he should, at fixed times, read the written law and the traditional dicta so as not to forget any of the rules of the Torah, and should devote all his days exclusively to the study of Talmud according to his breadth of mind and maturity of intellect. But he doesn't mean the Talmud the way we understand it. He means, in effect, analyzing material, philosophical understanding. That's how he's redefined Talmud. Okay, now um, go over to the to the next one. Um, uh, he's um, he talks about um, uh, he, he takes a, a you know again he's pushing the study of Torah. Um, if you take a look at number four, you shouldn't interrupt it. Um, he, again, this is this this section is very moralistic. This is this is not so much technical as moralistic, um, and. Uh, Notice in number six, he whose heart prompts to fulfill his duty pro this duty properly and to be crowned with the crown of Torah must not allow his mind to be diverted to other objects. He must not aim at acquiring Torah as well as riches and honor at the same time. 
okay? Um, and then in number seven, he talks about the one who says, well, I'm going to become rich and then I'll study, <coughs> right? Sounds like Tevya in one of his songs, mm -hmm. you know? Um, the point is that's, and, and again, this comes right out of the rabbinic tradition. No, you don't wait. You should never wait to study Torah. You should do it all the time. Um, and um, he, uh, take a look at number 10. This is where, he, this is a controversy that's occurring in his own day. And it also shows him a division from the way most communities dealt with scholars, rabbis, judges, and so on. Um, who'd like to read? Paul, do you want to read it? Yeah. Number 10, on the bottom of page 67. Uh, one, one, however, who makes uh, up his mind to study Torah and not to work, but to live by charity, profane the name of God, bring uh, the Torah into contempt, uh, extinguishes the light of religion, bring civil evil upon himself. Evil. 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 Oh, brings evil upon himself and deprives himself of, of, of life hereafter. For it is forbidden to de derive any temporal advantage uh, from the voice of the Torah. Okay, we can skip the rest of the paragraph because he's now quoting a bunch of stuff to point it out, but start number 11. It indicates a high degree. Yes. Isn't that so? Appropriate for today, where well, we have well, well, scholars who yeah. live on charity. Yeah, well, well, let's from get individuals and from the state. Well, let's just look at number eleven, and then we'll we'll get into the discussion. Sorry for interrupting okay. you, Sam, but I okay. think it's That's it's okay. important to to look at number eleven first. Okay. Well, it indicates a high degree of excellence in a man to maintain himself by uh, the level of the hand and. Uh, uh, and this was the known practice of early saints. Stop but there. It's exactly what you said, Sam, right? Mm -hmm. He is against Torah scholars being supported by the public purse. Or even by their in-laws. <laughs> no, I mean... Yes, no, no, I don't know. I, I think that he would consider family support to be fine. Okay. Because it's, you know, but um, nonetheless... He felt that a Torah scholar, and he had the examples of rabbis in the Talmud, you should do your own work. You should have a profession to earn a living as well as study Torah. And who's he, who's he like? And notice how definitive he is about this. He says they lose, it's a great evil and deprives himself of the love of the, 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 the thereafter. He's attacking the Gaonim in Babylonia. Right, who are professional sages. He's attacking the whole notion of a professional rabbinate. Yeah. Are right? You, are you offended? No, <laughs> I'm not offended. <laughs> In Ashkenaz, it wasn't the case. I'm Ashkenazi. <laughs> <laughs> he really believed that it was, it was corrupting to do that. And he, in his own day, he saw this in the Gaonim, you know? Um, who were lavishly supported um, by the public purse, so to speak, and he and he and he himself was very definitive about that. You know. Let me let me ask you something. The the word is mitparnes. Yeah. And in in the Ashkenazis, parnasim are the people who who are yeah. in charge of the communities. I mean, probably related. Yeah, probably related. The point is that. But in, not the rabbis. No. The it, lay people. Right in Ashkenaz. It a professional rabbinate eventually evolved. I mean, Rashi was not a professional. I mean, he had his own means of income. So, but there did evolve the notion of a professional rabbinate, um, where the community supported the sages so they could spend full time studying and serving the community, being communal judges, and a variety of things like that. And Maimonides was against that whole idea because he had to deal with it. You know, there was that... He, he didn't know what was going on in Ashkenaz, but the point is, it was happening in, in Babylon. Yes, Paul? But today's rabbi does not just give a sermon on Shabbos. He 
He runs the show. Yeah, no, I understand that. And and what's interesting is, is that the professionalization of clergy is really a function of the modern age, right? Uh, I mean, even in you know, even in um, er, you know, nineteenth century. Um, you know, many rabbis supported themselves mm -hmm. by doing other things for the community, like by being a shochet, yeah. right, or a mo, yeah. right. right? The point is that this notion of a professional clergy, in the way it is now exists, where a rabbi is not just a religious decider or teacher, but a pastor, that's a very modern idea. And it's one of the interesting things that when you go to the, the, the new diversity of religious communities, Initially, um, you know, you had priests, you had ministers, and then rabbis. And by the way, the rabbinate got especially professionalized in a variety of ways, like contracts and all kinds of other things after the Second World War. I mean, before that, rabbis rarely had, did not have contracts and things like that. In fact, it was the late Rabbi Wolf Kelman, who was the executive director of the Rabbinical Assembly, the, the, um, the conservative rabbinical organization, who really professionalized um, the way in which rabbis relate to their congregations for the protection of the rabbi and their families because you had situations where a rabbi was living in a home that the synagogue provided, he died, and they kicked his widow and children out of it, and they had nowhere to go. They didn't have pensions. I mean, so there's this whole trend towards it. And one of the interesting things that you see is that in some of the other religious communities in the United States, originally you did not really see professional imams. They usually were people who had other jobs, and then they did this on Fridays and other things that are often they had two different jobs that maybe the, the mosque hired them for kind of in a part-time way, but like there was one imam that, that I knew quite closely at, at Bard. He was the Muslim imam uh, for the Muslim community at Bard College when I was the Jewish chaplain. He was the Muslim chaplain. He had three different jobs. He had his own mosque. He came to Bard, but then he also was a prison chaplain. Right, so what so what you're seeing in the Muslim community is a move towards a more professionalized clergy, 